don't judge. I was testing M1 Max versus M1 Ultra, specifically the GPU performance on the Mac Studio, and I just, I just was not seeing the differences that I expected. And then I realized I was testing GFX Bench Aztec at 1440 on screen, and that just was not enough load. Like testing towing capacity between a Camry and a Tacoma when all the weight that you're towing is a MacBook Air. So I was barely putting a dent on the Max, never mind the Ultra, and I needed to test with 4K off screen in order to actually see what the Ultra could do. Same with Wildlife, after I put it into unlimited mode. And then it was like, boom, up to 1.9X. Then I was trying to decipher Apple's M1 Ultra versus GeForce 3090 graphs. And what were they even saying? Performance per watt up to max watt for the Ultra? And is that like gas mileage with a 100 mile per hour speed limit? Couldn't the Nvidia card just keep burning fuel up to 300? And did I even care about peak high number post or being able to actually fit it into a small enclosure without liquid nitrogen cooling or melting into Super Mario lava? At least until I realized it was only actually measuring power on GPU, not power through the whole entire system, which varies radically, especially between Apple's SOC-based approach and Nvidia's discrete card in a slot, like gas in both tanks versus everything consumed to get that gas into the tank as well. And, and it gets even weirder because I was looking at Shadow of the Tomb Raider tests, which do run cross-platform, but run as x86 through Rosetta Translation on M1 Max, but they do target Apple's low-level metal API, which can theoretically perform as good, if not better on M1 than it does on Intel Max. But that depends entirely on the quality of the API implementation and how well it's optimized for the Mac compared to <laughs> Windows. And holy wow, look at all those frames Nvidia is getting. And then you start to wonder what really matters. Like if M1 Ultra does slightly better on 3090 on Aztec 4K off screen and slightly worse on Wildlife Unlimited, because no one who wants CUDA cores or high-end ray trace gaming really cares at all how the M1 Ultra compares anyway. And anyone who just wants massive amounts of GPU cores with massive amounts of RAM behind them on their Mac can't even use Nvidia, much less get it in there. So. While ultra fusing two separate 32 core GPU blocks into one massive, massive 64 core GPU metal target with up to 128 gigabytes of RAM on die is an unprecedented table slap of silicon nerdery. It really doesn't change anything fundamental about either of those platforms. It's just chum for the headlines and comment sections for people who don't really grok how benchmarking really works anyway. And mostly because so many benchmarks now have been all wrapped up into tidy little apps or games that literally anyone, including terrifyingly me, can just download, run once and done. Then they just spit out numbers, sometimes highly relative and abstract with almost zero time and effort, all pretty for posting, but without really telling you how to run them, what to run them on, what the numbers actually mean or give you anything, anything in the way of the context needed to properly interpret them. They've become like pop culture or what I have started to call benchmark LARP, live action role play, especially, especially when you compare it to the painstaking work that an outlet like Enantec and a few others still manage to produce with incredible talent and a ton of high order bit effort behind it. Because the really ugly truth, the hideous truth is, while running benchmarks might be easier than ever, understanding them has become significantly more complex, especially in the SOC and APU age. And I'm not even talking about the simple stuff. Like if you're testing single core perf, realizing the M1 SOCs all have the exact same single cores, it's just, the bigger ones literally have way, way, end to the way, multi more of those cores. Or if you've been paid for coverage by the Intels and Qualcomms, but are also super beyond salty that Apple doesn't pay for that, like at all, you've got to disclose that in your snarky tweets, or you're just basically putting the PC into NPC. Or like if you're comparing the M1 Ultra package size to the Intel or AMD CPU package size, 
for your tech dad joke when M1 Ultra is a whole entire SOC with a CPU, yes, fair enough, but also 64 GPU cores, 32 A and E cores, never mind the media engines, the IO controllers, the RAM chips, but usually it's just way more complicated and nuanced than that. Like, don't laugh, but testing the 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro against the 13 inch 10th generation Intel MacBook Pro and doing video rendering and realizing H.264 in code doesn't hit the M1 Firestorm cores or the Intel Ice Lake cores. It hits the A14 generation media engine on the M1 box and the A10 generation media engines on the T2 coprocessor on the Intel box. So to actually test M1 versus Intel, you have to test with something like ProRes, which is still CPU bound on those specific chipsets on those boxes. Otherwise, the only thing you end up really testing is apples versus apples, older apples. Never mind figuring out what's hitting efficiency cores versus performance cores, which may matter given M1 has four E cores and M1 Pro and Max have two E cores, but M1 Ultra has two times two E cores, which we saw blow up just spectacularly with early A14 versus A15 hot takes, where the efficiency cores ended up being significantly faster and the performance cores only slightly faster, but significantly more efficient, which along with doubling the system level cache just ended up making the whole die way better for battery life. And that just buried analysts, bloggers, rebloggers. And since M2 may well be based on A15, like M1 was on A14, History could very well repeat itself with the next Mac mini, MacBook Air, and the next whole generation of Apple Silicon as well. Similar, if not exactly the same, what's hitting the Apple Neural Engine or ANE cores versus the GPU cores or even the AMX accelerators on the CPU cores because the machine learning controller taps into all of those and they all vary in scale to lesser and greater degrees across the entire M1 family. And unlike Metal and the GPU, Core ML can't treat them as a single target, but it can dispatch between them. So where you'd expect to get like 1.9X, up to 1.9X scaling on the M1 Ultra graphics workloads, you can really only expect closer to 1.5X scaling on the M1 Ultra machine learning workloads, unless they're tapping into the GPU as well, and then maybe it's like 1.7X. You get my point. That's not even touching on the CPU and media engine scalability, where some heavy workloads really can handle just as many compute units as you throw at them, and they'll give you close to linear scalability until they don't, until some gnarly bit of code or codec hits them and then just flattens out that hockey sticks. And then you have to go and find that piece of code or that codec and figure out where, when, and why it's all happening. Never mind how many other things can legitimately affect benchmarks and performance in general, like the ambient temperature, radios if you forget to go into airplane mode first, rogue processes if you forget to reboot first, other tasks if you forget to make sure no other tasks are running when you run your tests, even things like settings if you forget to make sure they're all correct and triple check that they're exactly the same between all the machines that you're testing, which is why it's just so damn easy to mark all those benches but so damn hard to do it right. And why I don't do it very much, frankly, anymore, not beyond superficially validating performance claims at the basic level. I just, I really, really don't wanna to contribute to the LARP culture or the comment toxicity. And I would rather just point people to a Nantech and the other experts, but also point out that if none of these numbers are really meaningful or important to you, that is perfectly 100% okay as well you really can just simplify all the way down without losing any nerd cred, zero nerd cred. Just start with the M1. Is it enough for you? For the vast majority of people, the answer is gonna be yes. But if you really do need more built-in ports and more performance, you can step up to the M1 Pro. In the MacBook Pro, yes, only for now, but who knows, maybe in the future, Apple will roll out a tweener Mac Mini Pro or iMac Pro, and that'll be an option too. And that'll cover just about everyone. But if you know, if you know your workload and you know even M1 Pro isn't enough and you want basically double the GPU, media engines and memory, you can jump up to the M1 Max and only, only in the rare cases where even that isn't enough, but double everything of that again will be, including price, you can still make that last leap for now to the M1 Ultra or 
If you think you will really truly need PCIe extension slots, then wait on the inevitable Apple Silicon Mac Pro. But if you're concerned about the price at all, if you're worried about the money that it'll be costing you instead of the money that it'll be making you, that is just a giant neon omega level mutant alert. Unless you already have just all the money and you wanna flex that new shiny, in which case you spend you. And if you wanna check my logic or my math on any of this, or just get involved in all the underlying tech behind this, so you can one day afford all of this, check out the algorithms, neural networks, and machine learning courses on today's sponsor, Brilliant. Basically, everything that the next generation of everything from silicon to software to services is gonna be built on, but also science and computer science, physics, quantum mechanics, game theory, and so much more. Because Brilliant is the online interactive STEM learning platform with a growing catalog of courses specifically crafted to help you learn concepts by working through them yourself in visual, hands-on ways. And all the lessons are thoughtfully broken up into bite-sized pieces so you can learn at your own pace, zero pressure. Like, have you ever wanted to learn to code, but you were put off by all the overly complicated traditional computer programming courses? Well, Brilliant has actual, fun, interactive challenges that let you shift blocks of pseudocode around, receive immediate feedback, and get results. You feel like you're solving puzzles, gaming even, but the whole entire time, you're learning how algorithms work. And once you know that, coding becomes way more engaging and way less intimidating. Because here's the secret. Everyone starts somewhere, and you can get started right now, today, for free. Just visit brilliant.org slash Ritchie or click on the link in the description. And the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Clicking on that button really helps out the channel. And so does hitting up this playlist for a full review of the Mac Studio, M1 Ultra, and so much more. All the details, all the inside info, all for you. Just hit that playlist and I'll see you in the next video.